environment and degree of dependency. Um, and shows us that in the words of the eloquent Dr. Seuss, a person is a person, no matter how small. Um, but this acronym can remind us of the non-essential differences between humans at various um, stages of development. So for example, I'm just gonna walk you through and kind of give you an example of how to use this tool. So for example, as a toddler, you were smaller than you are now. Or let's say even men are generally larger than women. Um, so women are generally smaller. Our size doesn't have anything to do with our value. Um, and that applies to the preborn as well. So just because they're smaller, just because they're more vulnerable, doesn't mean that they have any less value because they are in fact a human being. The same thing with level of development. We can say that toddlers are less developed than teenagers and that teenagers are less developed than adults, but it doesn't mean we can just, you know, um, doesn't mean we can just kill them off, right? Like, thank goodness that doesn't give us permission to like dump a, dump a toddler in the middle of terrible twos on the side of the road. Like that would be horrible, right? Just because they're le less developed and they don't understand things yet doesn't give us permission to do, um, to do anything to them. Environment also plays into this a lot. Um, just because the preborn are within the mother's womb doesn't give them less value. For example, a baby the day before its due date and the day of its delivery um, after it's been born, are there's no essential difference. You can't really draw a line and say, well, just because it was inside the mother's womb, it had less value. Like its environment doesn't make a difference on its value. There's no difference between the baby who was in its mother, mother's womb a day ago and the baby who's just been born. Um, it's the same baby, same level of development, only now he's outside of his mother's body. Um, and then degree of dependency. I'm dependent on people every day. I'm dependent on the people who drive trucks to deliver fuel to gas stations so that I can fill up my car. I am dependent on my roommates to help cover you know, the cost of our living in our apartment. I'm dependent on, um, on the farmers who grow the food that's in the grocery store so I can survive every day. Just because the embryo or the fetus is dependent on its mother's body for support doesn't give it less value. We're all dependent on people. And so that argument isn't really great either. Um, yeah. So in summary, just because embryos are smaller, so their size is different, doesn't give us the right to, to um, kill them. Just because teenagers are less developed than adults doesn't mean we can end the lives of all the teenagers on the planet. Um, your environment has no bearing on how valuable you are and your degree of dependency doesn't have any bearing on how valuable you are. We're all dependent. So this is a handy acronym and tool to keep in your back pocket. Um, so there have been, and we know this in our country, there have been some huge civil rights injustices when the idea of personhood has been divorced from the idea of humanity. The only thing that gives us, that we all have in common, that gives us our shared value is our humanity. So if we're all equally human, then we're all equally valuable. A lot of times um, pro-choice advocates will try and say, well, yeah, it's human, but it's not really a person yet. It's not conscious. It can't feel pain. It's not a person. Um, but we've seen before what's happened when we've said, oh, this person has a different color skin. They're not a person. We've seen what hap what's happened before when um, people have said, oh, we don't need to give the right to vote to women. They don't matter as persons and their voices don't matter in our government. Well, no, this alienates a huge section of our population from human rights. So this is why we fought the civil war. This is why suffragists fought for the right to vote. It's because they all recognized that our shared humanity gives us our shared value. Um, 
And for those of you who are like more mathematically minded, this equation at the top is kind of helpful. Person equals human. So your humanity gives you your personhood. The civil rights abuses come into play when we try to say that it's your humanity plus something else that gives you your personhood. Hopefully that helps clarify. So yeah, the only thing we have in common is our shared humanity. And you can see here, like these personhood abuses, they don't look very pretty. Um, if someone, I gave this training a couple nights ago and someone brought up the example of, yeah, okay, we have this picture of a concentration camp in Nazi Germany where Hitler decided Jews weren't persons and that we could exterminate them. But what about like the Japanese internment camps that we had here in the States during the, the um, during World War II? Like we've had a lot of personhood abuses in our country and we've had to fight really hard to overcome those but our nation is better off for having won those battles. So the abortion instance is just another of these personhood abuses where we're alienating a huge and vulnerable section of our population that deserves our support. So now we're kind of gonna go into, um, we're gonna go into some circumstances that people bring up. Um, to try and justify abortion. Now that you're equipped with the science and the philosophy to say, yep, it's a living human being, and that means it's a person, and that means it deserves equal rights. Um, well, sometimes people will try and throw you a curveball and say, well, what if the pregnancy is not her fault? What if she has no support? What if she's going to die if she carries the baby? Well, let's talk about those. We know that it's never justifiable to kill a human being. So in any of these situations, we would encourage the mother to choose life. And there's a lot of things we can do to help with that. Um, you should all know where your local pregnancy resource centers are. And if you don't know, you should look it up because this is a really good tool um, for you to say you're pro-life. Like, yeah, great. If you know the reasoning, great. If you live a pro-life life lifestyle, great. Be sure that you can help support mothers who need to, who are in vulnerable situations. So know your pregnancy resource center. Um, so with any of these circumstances, you want to kind of lean back on the discussion principles. So we'll go through those now. First, listen to understand. Um, again, people aren't going to care how much you know until they know that you care. Um, so if a woman is facing a really tough pregnancy, you need to show that you care and that you support instead of saying, oh, yeah, 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 you just need to choose life. Here's the Pregnancy Resource Center. Good luck. I'll see your baby in nine months. Like, that's not how it works. We're human beings and we need to know that others care about us. So um, if you don't understand where someone's coming from, ask clarifying questions. Listen to their view and don't just wait to respond. Um, and it says to you, awkward pauses are okay. They really are. Don't interrupt the awkward silence if it needs to be there. Sometimes people just need a chance to process what they've said or um, need a chance to rethink their reasoning. These are all good ways um, to let people think through their argument and think about what you've just said. So some of us are internal processors and just need that time. Definitely acknowledge the difficulties. Um, Pro-lifers definitely get a bad rap sometimes for just being pro-birth and not being pro-woman and pro-life. And the short answer to that is, no, we care about all life. We need to be there to support the woman who's going to, through this pregnancy. If she doesn't feel supported, then chances are she's not going to feel like she can choose life. So don't skip this step and acknowledge the difficulties. This is really important too when people ask you about abortion in the case of rape, because that's a really touchy subject and a lot of people have personal experiences with that, whether it's something they've gone through or something someone close to them has gone through. They need to know that you care about the person who has been through this traumatic experience and that you support her healing and her moving on with her life. Um, so yeah, this is why it's important to 
um, to support pregnant and parenting students on your campus. Um, build genuinely common, genuine common ground with the other party that you're having a conversation with. This is a tricky step because sometimes people wanna say, oh yeah, yeah, I guess like abortion in the case of like rape is okay because we wanna be compassionate and build common ground with the other person. Don't compromise your position. There are plenty of ways you can build common ground without compromising on the life of another human being. Oops, sorry. Um, just a side note, I don't know if you can see that, that popped up on my screen. If the video cuts out, it's because I don't have the paid version of Zoom. So just re-click the link that I sent you and we'll go back into this to right where we were. Um, but yeah, uh, don't compromise your position. You can find a lot of shared common ground. For example, last semester we took around our Planned Parenthood Truth Tour. We had bright pink panels and so people would sometimes come up to us and think we were Planned Parenthood and we'd say, well, not exactly. Like, we wanna share with you all the failed inspections that Planned Parenthoods have undergone and why the health department says that they are a hazard to health and safety. And people would get like really worked up. But this gave us a chance to build common ground with the other party and say, look, like you support Planned Parenthood because you want to help women in crisis. We oppose Planned Parenthood for the same reason. Women shouldn't be going to Planned Parenthood because um, Planned Parenthood botches abortions on a regular basis. And this is really dangerous for the woman because she can bleed out if she sustained internal um, hemorrhaging if the abortionist has poked through her internal organ walls, um, or she can develop an infection if the abortion is botched. Um, so our goal with this was to show people that we care for women and we express that care by opposing Planned Parenthood and supporting holistic health care that isn't going to cause abortions and isn't going to end the life of another person. So people were really receptive to that. All good? I think so. Okay. Yeah, and then this just shows that you're a human too and that you're not weird and that you think through things. So um, for any of these hard cases, hard cases too, I would definitely say trot out the toddler. Um, this is another example where like telling a story really comes in handy um, because you can create parallel examples to reasons why a woman would go and get an abortion. And instead of having a preborn child, you can, in the story, you can make that child a two-year-old um, or an older child. We would never say that poverty makes it permissible for a woman to kill her toddler. Um, if she's having trouble feeding her toddler, we're not gonna say, oh yeah, you should probably just, you know, get rid of him. No, that's not what we would say. We would say, well, let's provide resources in the community to you. Reach out when you're struggling and we can help you. We can provide meals for you. We can make sure your child going to school always has food. Um, we can help provide meals to your family and help you help lift you up out of poverty. The same holds true with abortion. We should be more willing to help women facing Women who say they're going to get abortions because they can't afford to feed their children or because they don't feel like they can support another child because they just don't have the means or the finances, we should say, okay, let's connect you with the resources in our community that exist to support people in those situations and help lift them out of those situations. So in the end then, you can see abortion is not the solution. Um, but it is in fact a reflection that society has failed women. It's really the fullest extension of lies that culture tells women about femininity and what it means to be a mother um, and what it, or rather what it means to be a woman um, as well as telling them you can't succeed without abortion because children are a hindrance. Um, so really it's abortion is where those lies take us. Um, and like I said before, sometimes in doing dialogue and outreach on campus, you'll come across people who have 
a personal experience with abortion. Do we still have everyone? Okay, good. Um, and in those situations, it's important to offer compassion and offer hope. Um, so be sure to know what your local post abortive resources are as well. So like Rachel's Vineyard, Project Rachel, um, that help provide emotional and spiritual healing to women who have had abortions because no one should have to go through that alone and feel like they can't come clean with something and have a fresh start. So just like we would say any of these choices are wrong, we know slavery is wrong, we know rape is wrong, we know genocide, domestic violence, these are all moral wrongs. Abortion is also on that list because it harms another human being. So to kind of wrap it up, abortion just isn't a preference issue. You can't say like, I would never have an abortion, but like I can't tell someone else what to do because it's a moral issue. Um, so it's important to take your stand like you guys are doing, forming yourselves, equipping yourselves and bringing the pro-life message to your campus. So that's what I got for you guys. You can take a picture of the slide too if you want. These are other great apologetics resources. Um, I think Equal Rights Institute is especially great. That's my own preference, but check them all out. So that's what I got. Does anyone have questions? Oh, you guys are muted. I can't hear what you're saying. The button should be at the bottom of your screen, bottom left. On you. Okay. So my question is like, what do you, how do you, well, I have two questions. One, how do you change, or how do you talk to people who like, um, like one of the articles I recently read, um, the abortionist said that he's like fully aware that it's a baby, but it's just like the legality of it that's like, allowing him to keep doing that what do you say to people that like agree that it's a baby but still like just are adamant that it's just not born yeah yeah and okay, and, okay. So that is, that is hold on stephanie you're cutting out i would try muting it it might be an echo okay okay tell me if this is better better? Okay. Um, yeah, I saw that video too. An interesting note is that he's one of the abortionists that practices in Omaha. Um, so it's kind of right here in our backyard. But okay, so sometimes like, we have a lot of good conversations on campus, but sometimes conversations just hit a point where you're like, you're not making any headway. Like, the other person refuses to see like what you're saying. The conversation just isn't going well. Um, and sometimes you just have to end a conversation and say, look, I'm glad like we had this conversation. Clearly we have the common ground. That this is a human being. Um, but since you're willing to like still admit that it's okay to kill those human beings and I hold that it's not, I don't think we can make any more progress in this conversation. Um, so sometimes like even after you've gone through drawing the parallels between like the civil rights movement and slavery, um, you know, after you've made all of those arguments, sometimes there's just not much more that you can do. And it's better to invest your time in a conversation that's going to be more productive and more fruitful. So does that help? Yeah, that helps. And then my second question is, um, so like what is what would be the ultimate goal, like the grand success of this, like of our whole organization kind of like to make abortion not necessary anymore, kind of, how would we, like sometimes women need more than just like the things, like they need more than just monetary support. How would we like integrate into our society, like change, would we have to just like change the whole like value system of our society to like make abortion so that women don't ever have to choose that kind of? Yeah, that's such a great question. So yes, the goal and why we go out on campus and why we have conversations 
It's to make abortion unthinkable where people have, where culturally we see that shift, where people look at abortion the way we now look at slavery and say, oh my gosh, I can't believe that was legal in our country. What a grave human rights injustice we've done. Um, and realize like what we were doing was never morally right. So yes, that's part of it. And that's why we go out on campuses and have these conversations, conversations to change hearts and minds one at a time. Um, kind of the second part of that answer is that, yeah, we need to build up our communities so that we can support women um, who are struggling to choose life in more ways than just monetarily. Um, for example, maybe they just need community, in which case, what a great instance that you guys at your schools have these groups and can like offer your friendship. Um, do something great for them that makes them feel loved and supported, like have a baby shower. Um, because yes, sometimes, for example, women choose abortions because they're in situations where domestic violence is at play. There are resources in your community to help take women out of those situations and put them into safe housing. Um, so it's all about looking in your community, seeing what resources are available. Um, for you guys in Lincoln Pregnancy Center, is gonna be a really good ally for you guys because they're connected with all sorts of resources like that. Um, yeah, so it's knowing what's out there in your community and getting out there and changing hearts and minds because the post row America, like this is what we're gonna need to prepare for. Like we gotta change those hearts and minds so that abortion is unthinkable and also build up so that we can support women no matter what their circumstances are. Cool. I have a question too, Stephanie. Sure. Um, frequently, I hear people talk about the quality of life for that baby after it's born as a reason to abort and that they might recognize that it's a person, but the quality of life after birth, whether it be a disability or whatnot, what argument would you use in that situation? Yeah. Um, I think one of my go-tos, and Kristen Hawkins talks about this all the time, is that in our world, we should work to eliminate the suffering and never the sufferer or the person who has experienced the who is experiencing the suffering. Um, so to give you an example of this, I think it's like Denmark that claims to have eradicated Down syndrome. Well, they haven't exactly eradicated Down syndrome. What they've done is they've aborted all the babies who have been diagnosed prenatally with Down syndrome. Um, and so, okay, I don't want to say like, it's 2019, but it's like, it's 2019, like our medical science is at a place where we should be looking to treat and heal instead of eliminate. Like, imagine what would happen if we poured funds and resources into um, researching ways um, for people with disabilities or Preborn children diagnosed with fetal abnormalities to have more, um, to have healthier lives. Like imagine the difference that we would see, the shift that we would see in our society, kind of getting back to Grace's question about like, well, how do we make that value shift? Let's pour our resources into life affirming, affirming, affirming medical decisions instead of life ending medical decisions. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. Yeah, any other questions? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I wonder, has Stephanie ever um, Can you hear Stephanie? somebody out for the coffee? Um, kind of. Really if I'm closer to the mic, that would probably help. You can repeat it for me. Did you hear him? He said he's wondering if um, you have ever taken someone out for coffee and said, hey, we really disagree. And, and, how, did and how did that go? Um, I haven't taken them out to coffee, but I've definitely had conversations with people on campus um, who have, who definitely disagree with me. Kind of the beauty about having these conversations is it teaches you how to disagree. Um, so, for example, I was at SDSU one time and I was having this conversation with a guy who comes from a community health background. So he was saying, like, we need abortion because otherwise women are just going to stay in poverty. And we were having this conversation and I was walking him through all of, like the science and the philosophy. And he was like, yes, yes. Like, I still think we need abortion because women are going to stay in poverty. And then 
we started talking about like birth control. And then at some point he brought up um, like the Catholic church teaching on birth control and abortion. Um, and he looked at me and he was like, are you Catholic? And I am Catholic. So I told him, yeah, I am, which was crazy because this is something that he like vehemently disagrees with, um, that he doesn't see a reason for. But we continued to have this great conversation because we were both respectful to each other. And it was so fruitful for me to hear his side of the argument and understand like where he was coming from and why he had formed the opinions that he had formed. So it's all about listening and being compassionate in dialogue and like learning to disagree. So I haven't invited anyone out for coffee who I disagree with like that, but yeah. Those conversations can be fruitful. Oh yeah, yes. Yeah. There's a yeah, you can come on up or I can repeat them, whatever. Your name's Matthew, is that right? Yes. Okay, this is Matthew. He's got a question for you, Stephanie. Okay. Um okay, where is that? One's kind of similar to a question that's been asked about um the abortionist who agrees that it's a baby but uh still performs abortions. It's kind of more of the legal level. Uh, like I'm sure you heard about like the bills that have been passed in Illinois and New York City about um, pretty much after birth abortion. How do we take that attitude and try to move it anywhere, I guess? So there's like such an extreme stance. Like, I mean, I just feel like the baby is there. It's living. It's breathing. It's not even dependent on the woman's body anymore because, but because it survived the abortion, it's still right to kill it. And, I don't know even how to start arguing because it just seems so extreme, you know? Right. Um, yeah. So that would be a place where like you would definitely need to build common ground. Um, so a resource you might want to check out is Kristen Hawkins has done a speaking tour called Lies Feminist Tell. And a student asked her this question at the end of her speech, right? So she's they're talking about this and this the student is saying like they've decided it's not a baby doesn't get medical treatment at, even though it was born alive after this botched abortion and Kristen asks her well okay what about children on the border and like draws this parallel and says would we deny treatment to a baby at the border who's just been born and needs medical attention or should we deny medical attention to that baby? Um, and the student says, no, but like the baby who's born in the abortion facility, they've decided isn't a baby. Um, so sometimes this analogy might cause someone to say, oh, like, I see what you're saying. What's the difference? One of these children was born in an abortion facility. One of them was born at the border. They have the same value and draw a different conclusion from that analogy that might be useful. So that's an analogy you can try. Um, yeah, sometimes you just have to end a conversation and say, we just have to agree to disagree, which is not ideal. I hate doing it, um, but sometimes you can only talk with someone for so long before you realize that you're not getting anywhere in the conversation. But I encourage you to check out Kristen's videos on that. And another question I had, uh, I have two more, they're kind of shorter, I think. Um, how, what's, I, I kind of have my own response to it, but I'm curious what your response is to the argument, if abortion's illegal, then women are still going to get abortions in unsafe ways. Well, ah. in even more unsafe ways. Yes, so you guys are hosting our Life After Row tour display and we're gonna talk all about this. We have a whole training on this. So you are gonna be excited about that. Um, but yeah, so the fact of the matter is women are still dying inside abortion facilities. Um, Tanya Reeves, I think it was in 2008, bled to death after her botched abortion facility or after her botched abortion procedure. She was in the Planned Parenthood office. Her procedure started at 9 a.m. Planned Parenthood did not call 911 until 4.30 p.m. that afternoon um, after they botched it, after they caused internal bleeding. So abortion facilities are not safe places for women today. Um, and it's interesting because before Roe, 
Dr. Bernard Nathanson, who was one of the leading figures in getting abortion legalized, admitted after the passage of Roe, or after the Roe ruling, that he falsified the numbers of maternal deaths attributed to back alley abortions. Because for the most part, women who were going to get abortions were still going to physicians, but because it was illegal, they were just going in through the back door so that no one would know that they were going in for an abortion, which is why they're called back alley abortions. Um, so yeah, the bottom line is abortion just isn't safe for women, even with it being legal. And one more. Sometimes I have a conversation with someone and I feel like it's going really well. I mean, I'm not perfect, but I feel like it's going well. And then suddenly they hit me with, you're a male, you're not allowed to have an opinion on this. And it's like, even at that point, like I can argue why males are allowed to have an opinion, but if the other person's already concluded that you don't have an opinion, then it's like, well, why would they listen to my argument and why I do? So right. it's like, it's kind of just like the conversation's over at that point. Gotcha. Well, hopefully the, like, the good points that you made stuck. Because here's the fact of the matter. Abortion, it's really handy that it's a moral issue and that arguments don't have gender. So it doesn't matter whether you're a man or a woman having this conversation. Um, your arguments definitely matter. And thank you for continuing to stand up for life because we really need men in this movement. Um, but you can, again, I'm really big on stories and analogies, and I would encourage you to check out an Equal Rights Institute resource on this. I think it's on their blog. Um, they talk about how postpartum depression, right, is something that a man can also never experience. But if you saw a woman who wanted, who was suffering from postpartum depression, who wanted to injure her child, hurt her child, kill her child in some way, he would definitely step in and protect the child and help get the woman the healing resources she needed, right? So it's the same thing with abortion. It's a moral issue. And just because it's something a man is never going to experience, never going to undergo pregnancy, doesn't mean that men can't have a say in this conversation. And in fact, we really need them to. Um, so yeah, most women are not most, but a lot of women say they went to go get their abortion because they felt like they didn't have the support of their partner Whereas if their partner had just said something, they would have had the baby. Oh, that's what I got. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Matthew. Does anyone else have any questions? I don't think so. Okay. Stephanie, okay. I think that's all our questions. Awesome. Anyone from Blue Valley North with questions? All right. Well, I will see you guys around then. Thanks for jumping on and thanks for having me. Thanks so much. All right. Feel free to reach out. Bye. Hey. Cool.